Good morning, church. How are we feeling today? Everybody good? Would you go ahead and stand up to your feet? Before we jump in, I want to encourage us out of God's word. This is Psalm 51, verse 10. It says this, and it's our prayer today. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a loyal spirit within me. Do not banish me from your presence, and don't take your Holy Spirit from me. And I want as a covering today for this just to be our unifying cry today, that the Holy Spirit would come and he would meet with us, um, that he would search us and know us. So before we start, before we sing a word, I want to pray, and, uh, and then we'll jump into worship. Can we do that today? Let's pray. Jesus, we love you, and we invite you into this place today. Holy Spirit, would you come? Would you make a difference as you always do when you enter the room? Father, I pray today for repentant hearts as we approach you. God, that we see you rightly during this time. We love you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Come on, sing Holy Spirit. In Holy Spirit, come rest on us. You're all we want. You're all we want. Sing it out. In Holy Spirit, come rest on us. You're all we want. You're all Sing it up. I won't forget the wonder of how you brought deliverance, the exodus of my heart. Cause you found me, you freed me, held back the waters for my release. Oh, Yahweh. Come on. Sure the
stronghold will crumb in your presence. Come on, sing. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become glory of your this is our prayer today let us become aware of your presence let us experience the glory today you are the reason that we're here thank you Holy Spirit I love when the Holy Spirit is in the room because nothing is impossible nothing is impossible So church, whether you're the one that ran in the room because you're excited or you're the one, the individual or the family that limped into the room today, you're in the right place. And just with your spouse or just by yourself, if you have a need, would you just, would you just hold your spouse close? And would you speak that into existence? Would you speak life over that, over that situation right now? It may be one word, it may be a whole prayer. But church, there's nothing like unity to see God move in a new way. Do you believe it? Have you experienced it? Today, Jesus, we're believing for the impossible. God, I thank you for being our sword and our shield, for protecting us, but also moving on our behalf. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for being here today. We want to honor you with our praise. We want to honor you with our worship. We love you, Jesus. It's in your mighty name we pray. 
Amen. Come on, would you honor him today with your worship? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Come on, church, like you believe it today. I really do feel like the Lord is moving today. So thank you for stepping in with us today. What a great time together. It's only going to get better. Would you turn to your neighbor and say it's a great day, and then you can go ahead and be seated. Looking back, I just know that God had a hand in all of our story. When they started discussing small groups at City Hope, um, it was something we both automatically thought we wanted to be a part of. I just wanted to be able to walk into the church and shake hands and say hey and just know everybody. It really connected us to the church. I didn't know then I was going to need the group, but, but boy, I mean, God knew. I always knew that, or I always felt like we were meant to have children. I just wasn't sure when it would happen or how it would happen. Literally out of nowhere, I find out I'm pregnant. I had never seen a positive test in my life, so I did not even know that it was possible. Because you can hope all you want, um, but there's nothing like seeing it in your hand. So there was a lot of times that um, I just hoped to turn the page, like when are we going to make it to the next chapter, the good chapter. That pregnancy wasn't successful, and we did, we did end up miscarrying. It's almost like the good outweighed the bad um, because the gift we received by knowing for sure it can happen. I decided to just let our small group know what we were going through. Definitely our prayer warriors during the whole process of us trying to expand our family. Um, just having our small group there to lean on um, through the good and the bad um, is just irreplaceable. did end up getting some really, really exciting news, and it was that we found out we were pregnant. Swayze was born uh, November 19th. We made it here safe and sound, and we, we are just over the moon. We couldn't be more happy to have him. He's just such a little joy. Uh, I'm just here to tell you that I don't know where we would be without our small group, without having them to lean on. Um, it's so important, I think, just by design, we are just created to be around people and we need encouragement. And sometimes it's not even uh, you that needs the encouragement, but you may need to join for somebody else. I mean, they, you just never know. If you feel that tug to join, do it. You don't, you don't know what you may face in the next year or two. You don't know what, you know, God may be trying to form this group. And if you say no, you may rob someone else of their their blessing, you know. Um, I would just encourage you to not to just respond to the tug if it's to join a group. Join a group, you know. Don't don't miss out. You know, as we were listening to that story, something hit me so hard. I, I turned around, I looked at the room, and I felt like God was saying, "There's people in this room right now." whose story is the exact same as Sarah and Jeff's. You're in some type of spiritual battle. Maybe it is trying to have a kid and, and it's not happening right now, but maybe it's a financial struggle. Or maybe you're just trying to stay married and have kids too. You know, like that's difficult too. Parenting is hard. I don't know what your battle is, but the only difference between you and Sarah and Jeff at the end of that story is that you're still alone. When it comes to small groups or things like this, I always hear this, I'm just looking for a sign. Anybody look for signs, you know what I'm talking about? 
you're a sign looker. God, show me a sign. But, but sometimes you don't need a sign when there's a solution right in front of you. And this morning, there's a solution right in front of you. If you're stuck in a spiritual battle, if you're feeling alone, if you're feeling isolated, if you feel like you don't have anywhere to turn, well, guess what? God is putting people around you right now. All you have to do is say, I'll sign up for a small group. I'll, I'll take a chance. I'll do my best. I'll jump in. And it's group launch today. So there's your sign and solution all in one, okay? But let me encourage you. Take a step. Sign up for a small group. They kick off today. And I promise you it's a decision that you won't regret. Well, welcome to church. Excited you're here. Is anybody else excited to be in church? Come on. Yeah. Online family, we're, we're pumped that you guys are here as well. Thank y'all so much for being with us. If this is your very first time, we want to get to know you. We want to meet you. But maybe more importantly, we just want to show you uh, that our church is more than just a Sunday experience. Like this is a journey. This is a group of people who are in unity and believing together. So on your way out, stop by our Connect Center uh, and give us the opportunity to get to know you a little bit. You're going to hear about some things happening at our church. For instance, this coming Saturday is our outreach day. You're going to want to be a part of that. Uh, but you're also going to hear about our heart. And our heart is that you don't stay still. That in your walk with Jesus, you're taking steps. You're growing. One of the things we've been talking about a lot lately is baptism. You've been hearing us say, you know what, if, if you recently got saved or if you need to put a stamp on your relationship with Jesus and you've never been water baptized before, take a step. Get baptized. Uh, and if you've been at City Hope any amount of time, you know when we do ba baptisms, it's an actual party, okay? You know what I'm talking Like it's a family reunion with water, okay? Somebody really loves it. <laughs> and it is. It's exciting. And that's not changing, but something is changing here at City Hope. Uh, usually we would just invite you to be baptized and then you would uh, attend the morning of and we would tell you about your decision. But we're adding another step because we believe that God is really impressing on us to help come alongside you in your journey with Jesus. And, and what we're going to do is we're going to offer a class that happens a week before you get baptized. And in that class, we're going to talk about uh, the importance of the, de the decision that you're making, but we're also going to talk about what it looks like after you come out of the water and what God uh, has for you and the steps that you're going to take after you're baptized. But what we want to do is just bring some in intentionality to it and give you the opportunity to grow. So if that's you and you feel like you want to get baptized or you feel like God's been pressing that step on your, on your heart, we want to invite you to a baptism class, not happening this Wednesday, but next Wednesday. So you can sign up for that at cityhope.cc slash baptism, or you can visit our Connect Center. Well, look, I'm happy you guys are here. We're starting a brand new series this morning called Wildfire. I hope you brought something to take notes with because it's going to be great. So let's get ready for week one of Wildfire. What's up, everybody? <laughs> welcome to church. I'm so glad that you're here. Malwas, help me out. Let's welcome the rest of our church family. Great to have you guys with us today. Wherever, uh, wherever you are, I'm so glad that you're here with us. Today is a big day. We are kicking off a series, but we're also kicking off our small group semester, as you know. Uh, and I hope that that means that you are in a group. Um, because as we go through this series, I really believe there's going to be some, some really great conversations and discussions that are going to come um, out of this series that are going to kind of spill over into your group. So I hope you're in a group. It's not too late to get into a group, so, so do that. But we are kicking off this series, which um, I, I really believe is so important for the life of our church. Um, and even the way we got to this series is a story for another day, but just seeing God um, just lay some things out and prepare us for this season. In some ways, uh, actually in a lot of ways, this is a sequel. How many of you guys like sequels? 
But every now and then there's a good sequel, right? Every now and then. Uh, this is a sequel to a series we did last year called Wind and Fire, uh, which was all about the person of the Holy Spirit, which we did, I believe it was right after Easter last year. Uh, so you may want to go back and check that out because and, and, we, we, we talk a lot more in that series about who the Holy Spirit is. This series is really more about when the Holy Spirit came and empowered the church and kind of what the church in Acts looked like. Um, because ultimately, we're that same church. Like it's not, that story did not end. It is not something that stopped. It, it is a continuation into today. So for us to be able to look back in a crazy culture that we're in right now, in a season where the church is needed, where God is still using and wanting to use the church to, to move the gospel forward, um, the best way for us to understand what that looks like is really to look back and to look at the first church, the birth of the church, and understand what God's trying to do. So, so that's where we're at. That's where we're going to jump in. Uh, so let's do this. We're going to start by kind of reading um, the first nine verses of the book of Acts. So how many of you guys actually have a paper Bible? Anybody? Okay, like four people. A few more. Okay. Um, so I'm going to read from here. We are going to put it up on the screen so you can read along there, but uh, it's just a little bit easier with it being a little bit you know, longer for me to just kind of read it from here. So, uh, so we're going to kick this thing off. Acts 1, 1 through 9. You ready? Come on, 11 o'clock. You ready? Okay, here we go. In my first book, I told you, Theophilus, about everything that Jesus began to do and teach until the day that he was taken up to heaven after giving his chosen apostles further instructions through the Holy Spirit. Verse three, during the, during the 40 days after he suffered and died, he appeared to the apostles from time to time and he proved to them in many ways that he was actually alive. And he talked to them about the kingdom of God. Once when he was eating with them, he commanded them, do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised, as I told you before. John baptized with water, but in just a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when the apostles were with Jesus, they kept asking him, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore your kingdom? Jesus replied, the Father alone has the authority to set those dates and times, and they are not for you to know. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And then in verse 9, after saying this, he was taken up into a cloud while they were there watching and they could no longer see him. Let's pray. Lord, I just thank you for your word. I just thank you, God, that we are a church, God, that just loves your word. And God, today as we unpack and open up, we just ask Holy Spirit that you would come and speak and guide and direct us today. As we begin this study, as we begin this season, God, I just pray that you will be so evident as you already are today as you've already moved in our hearts, as we've already welcomed you in, I just pray that you would continue to move in our lives, in our hearts, in our families. God, that, you would, that your word would be illuminated to us today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. All right, so as we kind of, today we're just kind of laying some groundwork, okay? We're just kind of setting a little bit of a foundation. So there's two big things that I want you to get today. Um, and the first one is this, that just kind of sets this whole series up, and it's this, is that we are a part of a larger story. You and I, we are a part, the church, we are a part of something so much bigger than what we realize, okay? If you go back, we were to go back and look at that verse we just read, at the very beginning, Acts 1-1, um, it says that, that he told all the things that Jesus began to do in his previous book. See, Luke was the writer of Acts. Luke also wrote the Gospel of Luke. So what Luke is doing right here is he's connecting these two books together, and he's actually addressed them to a guy named Theophilus, and which is something we don't really know a ton about other than most likely what happened is this guy was a kind of a wealthy Roman nobleman, and he was the patron that paid for this massive project that Luke undertook. Because you see, Luke wasn't one of the apostles. 
Luke wasn't one of the disciples that followed Jesus around town to town like the other gospel writers. You know, you may, you may think that just because it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John that Luke was one of those guys, but he actually wasn't. Luke came around much later, probably somewhere around Paul's second missionary journey. We find that most scholars believe that he kind of connected up with Paul and, and would kind of begin to follow the way and rub shoulder to shoulder with, with the move of God in that way. So here's Luke sometime later, but yet he feels compelled to write an account of this massive story that's unfolded. So what Luke does, most scholars believe that he was a medical doctor, but we also know that he was quite the historian because of this account that he put together. So he went on this massive journey to go around and begin interviewing people that had been healed, people that had spent time with Jesus, the disciples, the apostles. Like he, he went to anyone that he possibly could that had spent time with Jesus, followed him from town to town, seen miracles, and he interviewed them. So what he did is he compiled this amazing story from eyewitness accounts. And he built kind of this history of Luke and Acts, which in a lot of ways, as we read right there in Acts 1-1, is a continuing story. And I think that's what Luke wants us to see, that the gospel of Luke is not separated from the book of Acts. He actually says that the gospel of Luke is what Jesus began to do. So the book of Acts is what Jesus continues to do. It's the next step. It's the next part of this story. It's not a, a stop and now here's this new thing. No, it's actually the way the whole thing was meant to be from the very beginning. And Luke lays it out for us so perfectly. I and mean, it's absolutely beautiful the way that he does. He shows us this grand narrative, this grand story. But there's actually one event um, that overlaps between the two accounts. So at the very end of Luke, at the very beginning of Acts, we see, we see something that kind of overlaps, and it's this in verse 9. We just read it, but it says this. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. We call this the ascension. Okay, there was the cross, the crucifixion, there was the resurrection, and then the ascension. And this is an absolute vital and critical event in the sequence of everything that happened. And we don't always get that, but I want you to hear this today, that this is as critical as the cross and the resurrection is his ascension. All of these things had to happen for you and I to wind up where we are today. It's important. So the ascension, you know, which could have been somewhat of an awkward experience. I don't know. He kind of fluttered up into the, into the sky and he, he sounds like he hid behind some clouds. I don't know. But this was not his retirement, like, send off. You know, and I think sometimes we think that, like we think, okay, Jesus, the gospel's ended, so Jesus' time ended, and now he's handed off the baton to the next, to the young bucks. Hey, tiger, go get them. You can do it, pal. I'm watching up here playing bingo, playing some golf in my retirement village, but you go get them, bud. Like that's not what Jesus is doing. Okay, Jesus did not in any way back up, retire, and anything. He is just as engaged as he ever was before. What the ascension did is the ascension changed his relationship to humanity. Because when he ascended, he literally ascended to the throne, his rightful throne to rule and reign at the right hand of the Father, Hebrews 12, 2 tells us that, that he is seated at the right hand of the Father, ruling and reigning. That is what Jesus is doing. So he changed his relationship with humanity. We talked about it before, but when Jesus was here physically on this earth, he was a man. Flesh and blood, just like me and you. He was a man. He laid down his divine nature. He laid all of that stuff down. So what that means is that Jesus was confined to the same space and time just like any other human being. And we see this through the Gospels because there's a story where a, uh, a synagogue ruler had a sick daughter. And, and you see him, his name is Jerry, and you see him running to Jesus and saying, please come with me. My daughter's sick. She's way over here. I need you to physically come with me to heal my daughter. There's the woman with the issue of blood. She comes to Jesus and she just knows that if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I will be healed. Why? Because Jesus was physically a man. And in order to get to Jesus, you had to physically go to him. I mean, he was confined to space and time. Mary and Martha, they come to Jesus and they say, hey, listen, our brother, the guy you love, Lazarus, he's sick. 
He's not going to make it. They had to go get him, tell him, send word to him. Why? Because Jesus was confined to space and time. But with the ascension, that dynamic, that relationship completely changed. When he ascended to his throne, now he is literally everywhere at all the time. That's why you and I can call on the name of Jesus at any time and he answers. He responds. He is there. We have access to him because he ascended. He did not retire. He was promoted. Okay? So without the ascension, you and I wouldn't be here right now. It took this local context, this local ministry that Jesus was doing with with individuals on kind of a small scale. And when he ascended, the whole movement was able to go global. Because now anywhere I am, I can be in contact with Jesus Christ. I can call in the name of Christ, even in South Alabama. Right? We can call in the name of Jesus Christ and he responds, he listens, we have access to him. That's amazing. Okay, but here's the second part of it. That's not it. Okay, because now what is he doing now that he is sitting on the throne, now that he is ruling and reigning, what is he doing? And this is what I want us to get. He is leading and heading up his church. That is what he is doing in heaven at the right hand of the Father right now. He is leading his church. The church that he birthed and that we continue. And you see, you know, this is not going to surprise you in any way, shape, or form. But the sequence of events that we see are intentional. There's a cross. There's a resurrection. There's an ascension. The spirit comes and the church goes. All of those things had to happen in that order for the church to be birthed to affect the ends of the earth. It all had to happen in that way. But what we need to grab hold of is that Jesus Christ, his reign did not end at the end of the Gospels. It continues into the church era, the church age, where he then leads and launches his church into the world. Paul says it this way in Colossians 1. He says, Christ is the head of the church, which is his body. Christ is the head. Christ is still leading his church to this day. Jesus Christ believes in his church to this day. Right? Why? Because the church, listen, this is so big. The church is the primary way that God's work gets done on this earth. And the reason is, it's because the church is continuing the work of Jesus. The way his work continues on this earth was he birthed the church. He built the church. That's how his work moves forward. That's how it continues. It's not the only way God works, but so much, almost everything that gets done on this earth for the kingdom of God happens through the church that Jesus himself leads, like personally leading the church. Okay, so we, as a church within the church, the universal church, Right? We are being led by Jesus Christ, and we'll get to it in a second, but we are empowered by the Holy Spirit for the mission that Jesus, the head of the church, is sending us on. Hey, go into the world and make disciples. Okay, but what does he say? Right there, we just read it in verse 4 of Acts 1. He says, but wait. Why? Because you can't do it on your own. You're going to need the empowering of the Holy Spirit, but ultimately Jesus sets the vision and the mission. If you're a leadership guy, a business guy, you know, you... Jesus is setting the vision. He's setting the course. He's saying, this is where we're going, but don't go yet because you're going to need a little bit of help. You're going to need the Holy Spirit. We're going to get to that in a second. But first, we live in a day right now in our culture and our world where a lot of people are disconnecting their faith from church. And there are a lot of reasons for this. One of the chief reasons is that our culture is the most individualistic culture in the history of mankind. And that is proven. That's not just me exaggerating. Right? The, right now, people, humanity is all about me, what I want, my purpose, who I am, what I, you know. It's all about me, 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 me. That has never been the way of God. The way of God has always been about a people, a gathering, a group, a family. From the beginning, what's God building? A family. Go all the way back to Genesis. He is building a family. He's not building an individual. Even Jesus, the most powerful individual that ever walked this earth, he was not all by himself. What did he do? He grabbed 12 people. 
Then he grabbed 72 people. Then he grabbed 120 people. And as we're going to see in a minute, and then it was 3,000 people. And then it was 12,000 people. And then it was 30,000 people. Right? But it, it was never just him. But we live in that kind of culture. And there are a lot of reasons, in individualistic, but also just to put it out there, there's a lot of people been hurt by the church. There's a lot of people been burned, abused, offended by the church. I grew up in the church. I've been hurt by the church. I've seen abuse. My parents have gone through things. Many of you have gone through things. Right? Why? Because the church is full of imperfect people trying to do the perfect work of God. But yet we're still imperfect people, broken and hurt. And there's, there's history, there's fallen leaders, there's abuse, there's all this kind of stuff. But listen, Jesus Christ still believes in his church. He hasn't given up on his church. It's still plan A. It's still what he is wanting and the only thing that he believes in to ultimately go to the ends of the earth and reach the world. It's through his church. He believes in it. Doesn't change the reality that we do get hurt from time to time. Right? And I hate that. I'm sorry. You know what? If we haven't offended you or hurt you, then awesome, because we probably will. Right? I mean, it's something like we're, we're just, we're, we're humans. And it's the reality of it all. But, but Jesus believes in his church. Jesus believes in his church. And so should we. We should believe in his church. I love the image and the words that he uses. He actually calls his church his bride. Think about that. It's not just a project to him. It's not just an initiative. It's not just a nonprofit. It's not just this thing that he does. But he says, the church is my bride. I love my church. There's a story in, in 2 Kings about a guy named Naaman who was a, a military leader and he at some point in his life got leprosy. And so one of his wives' servant girls was a Hebrew girl and she said, you should go to Israel and you should see the prophet and the prophet will, can heal you of leprosy. And so he and his entourage, the whole bunch, they go down to Israel, they knock on Elisha's door. Um, Elisha does not come to the door, he sends one of his servants to the door, which was a big no-no in that culture, offended this mighty general, Naaman. Um, but the, the servant just simply says, well, Elisha says, hey, just go down to the Jordan River and wash seven times and you'll be healed. And first off, Naaman was angry that Elisha himself didn't come to the door. How dare you send a servant to speak to me? But secondly, the Jordan River was nasty, nasty. It was disgusting. And he said, how dare you ask me to go dip into that nasty place, that horrible place. So thank goodness Naaman had some really smart people around him. And so these people said, hey, listen, if he had asked you to do something really, really hard, you would have done it. Like, what's the harm in it? This is an easy task. He didn't tell you to climb a mountain or trek across a desert somewhere. Like he just said, go dip in the water seven times. So he does, and of course, Naaman is healed. Here's the point. A lot of Christians in our world right now do not realize that the miraculous healing power of God is often in dirty rivers. That even in the church, it's not pretty, it's messy, we don't have it all figured out. I don't have it all figured out. I'll be the first to tell you. Right? If I haven't offended you yet, I probably will at some point. Like, I don't, I don't know. I don't have it figured out, but I'm telling you something. I am listening to Jesus being led by the Holy Spirit because the church is the hope of the world. Actually, the empowered church is the hope of the world. Whenever we understand that and are empowered by him, the life-transforming power of God is in a messy, messy place. And we've got to catch that. What I really want is I want us to fall in love with his bride. I want, I want us to fall in love with just this community of faith where we love and pray for and fight for and support each other, where we, where we are empowered to go into the world and make a difference. Like that's what we're called to be. But we are a part of a much larger story. We're a part of this thing that's been happening for 2,000 years now that Jesus Christ himself birthed and is still leading and still believes in. That's awesome. That's amazing. That's number one. Number two is this. 
is that we need a greater reliance on the Holy Spirit. As the church, as our church, we need a greater reliance on the Holy Spirit. That you and I, we cannot become, we cannot, we cannot become everything God wants us to be without the Holy Spirit. And as we look through the book of Acts over the next few weeks, um, we're going to look at some very specific stories. But what we're, what, what we're going to see is that the Holy Spirit is constantly, continuously moving. This, this Acts 2, where we're going to read in a moment, with that this initial outpouring of the Holy Spirit was not the only time. You constantly see encounters and move. You constantly see the people were filled with the Spirit, and they were empowered to go and do what they were called to do. Jesus leads his church, and he empowers, through the Holy Spirit, us to actually accomplish the mission that he's given us. But Jesus is leading, and the Holy Spirit is empowering us for the mission of God. I find this so amazing. Let me read this verse, then I'm going to explain it to you. John 16, 13 says this, When the Spirit of truth comes, that's the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on His own, but will tell you what He has heard. He will tell you about the future. He will bring me, this is Jesus saying this, He will bring me glory by telling you whatever He receives from me. I love this. And I've told you this before, I think back in Wind and Fire, we talked about it a little bit more in detail. But the entire time Jesus was in ministry, actually, let me back up. Scholars even believe, you know, we always joke, sometimes preachers joke that, that um, it, was probably, it was probably terrible to have Jesus as an older brother, you know, because he was probably parting his Cheerios and he was doing miracles around the house and all this kind of stuff. You know, those, those are great preacher jokes. But in all reality, most likely Jesus did not do anything exceptional until the, the Jordan River, until he was baptized in the spirit. Like there's no proof of it whatsoever. That was the moment that changed everything. Here's the point. The point is, is that Jesus' entire ministry, three and a half years of ministry, every single thing he did, actually even his birth, every single thing he did was by the power of the spirit. He was a man. He was the new Adam. He was meant for you and I to see a prototype of what we were supposed to look like. So he was, he was a man. Empowered by the Spirit to do miracles, to walk on the water. The Spirit was the one that resurrected him. It was all by the power of the Spirit. But what this says in John 16 is that after Jesus ascended and went to heaven, the roles reversed. Now the Spirit is completely reliant on Jesus. Wherever Jesus says go, that's where I'm going to send them. Whatever Jesus says, that's what I'm going to tell them. Right? Isn't that amazing? That for three and a half years, Jesus was completely reliant on the Spirit to do the very things we see the entire church doing in the book of Acts. Why? Because Jesus says, I want you to do what I do. He even said, greater things will you do, church. Greater things. The, the, the big debate in theological circles is, is that quantity or is that quality? Right, that we as the church will do greater things than Jesus. I don't think we're going to do greater things than Jesus in, in terms of quality, because he did some pretty great things. But we will absolutely do greater things than Jesus in quantity when every single one of us are empowered with the same Holy Spirit that empowered Jesus Christ as he walked this earth. We will do greater things. Because there's a whole bunch of us coming together in unity to go out and impact to the ends of the earth, empowered by the same Holy Spirit. We will not do anything. We will not become the church that we're called to be without the Holy Spirit, without more of a reliance on him. We can never become that. We need him to empower us to live out the life that we've been called to live out, the mission that we've been called to live out. You see it all through the book of Acts. Miracles, healings, incredible things, all because of the Holy Spirit. And I said this early on, and I'm going to repeat it just because it popped in my mind. But Jesus said, here's the mission. Here's the cl clean, plain as day. Here's the vision. The vision is to go and make disciples. Baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Make disciples. Like, like let's, and then go and reach more. Like That's the mission. That's the vision. Jesus says at the end of Matthew, or at the end of all the Gospels, but most clearly at the end of Matthew. But then at the very beginning of Acts, what does he say? But wait. I know it's clear as day. I know I've given you a clear vision. You know where to run, but don't you dare go yet. Why? Because you need the power of the Holy Spirit. You'll mess this thing up if you don't have the power of the Holy Spirit. You will fall flat on your face, church, if you do not have the power of the Holy Spirit. Rely on him. 
There's two parts to the power of the Holy Spirit that I want to explore real quick and then we'll wrap up. The first is the purpose of the power of the Holy Spirit. We've talked about this even last series, the means of grace. We talk about the purpose of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the empowering, the personal and empowering presence of God to us and through us, right? For the work of God, for the mission of God, like we need the Holy Spirit. He is first working in us. We talked about that all through the means of grace. The Holy Spirit is the one that administers God's grace, right? We put ourselves in a spot, in a position to receive more of God's grace. How? Through the Holy Spirit. Right? It's the grace of God that changes us to do what we cannot do on our own, right? to sanctify us and heal us and you know, all the things that we've talked about before. Okay? But also, the purpose of the power of the Holy Spirit is to work through us to accomplish the mission that God has for us. And we see this in Acts 2 at the initial outpouring of the Holy Spirit, verses 1 through 4. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. And they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. This is the moment. Jesus said, wait. They went and they prayed for 10 days in an upper room, 120 people seeking God's face in unity together. And then in that moment, the Holy Spirit came. And the very next moment, this is amazing. Many of you know this story. The very next moment, Peter steps out with 120 spirit-filled believers with him and he begins to preach the gospel and over 3,000 people give their life to Jesus Christ in that moment. But what's amazing is that 50 days earlier, Peter was the one denying Jesus. And it wasn't just that he denied Jesus because he was going to get killed. It wasn't just that, hey, are you, are you one of his guys? If so, I'm going to crucify you too. No, it was like a 13 or 14-year-old little girl that said, hey, aren't you one of his followers? And Peter said, no, 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 that's not me. That's not me. That's not me. And 50 days later, this man stands before the entire nation and preaches the gospel of Jesus Christ. And 3,000 people are saved. Why? Because of the empowerment of the Holy Spirit to do things he could not do on his own, just like that. We need more of a reliance on the Holy Spirit because from there you see, like I mentioned, the church just begins to expand and grow and begins to spread like wildfire because of the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus leading the church and the Holy Spirit empowering the church to go where Jesus says go. There's a quote um, that I want to read. It's a little bit long, so bear with me. It's by a guy named Simon, Simon Ponsonby in his book, More. But he says this, and I love this first line. He says, the Holy Spirit filled the church that the church might fill the world. At the heart of that first Pentecost outpouring and of every subsequent visitation from on high is the receiving of power to witness to Christ. That's Acts 1.8. Yes, the Spirit comes to bring us the actuality and assurance of our salvation. Yes, the Spirit comes to bring us the knowledge of our adoption. Yes, the Spirit comes to instill in us the life and the character of Christ. Yes, the Spirit comes to impart the intimacy and the glory of God to us. And yes, the Spirit comes to impart gifts for the building up and blessing of the body of Christ. But, he does all of that, but... Power from on high to point to the one seated on high is among the preeminent purposes of Pentecost. For you and I to be filled with the Holy Spirit, the ultimate purpose is so our lives, our words, our actions will point to the one seated next to, fa to, the, to the Father God right now. So that everything we do is pointing to him, so that we are empowered to live out that mission. That's what we need the Holy Spirit's power for. So Jesus says, go, and then we're empowered to go. The purpose of the power of the Holy Spirit. The second thing and the last thing is this, is the pouring of the power of the Holy Spirit. A little bit later in the New Testament, in Ephesians 5, uh, the Apostle Paul, he writes this. He says, be filled with the Spirit. 
We've talked about this before, but just for a little bit of a refresher, this is, is kind, of an, a, kind of a continuous action verb. It's this verb that is more like be being filled. It's not a one-time thing. And we see this all through the book of Acts. There's constantly fillings, fillings, fillings. What I'm telling you and what Paul's telling you is being filled with the Spirit is not a one-time thing. As the church, a reliance on the Holy Spirit means that we are open-handed every day asking for a fresh filling of the Holy Spirit in our life. Why? Why is this a big deal? Why is Paul telling us this? Well, we are likened to vessels and we are cracked vessels. We're on the road to restoration, but we are still broken and cracked vessels. And when you pour something into a broken and cracked vessel, what happens? It leaks. It leaks. So what do we do? We go as the church, as individuals, as families, and every single day we open up our hearts and our lives and we say, I want a fresh filling today. I want more of your spirit. I want more of this power. I want more of you in my life. You know, whenever, whenever there is a filling or a pouring, it requires three things. A container, right? And we're all a container. We're a vessel. The, the moment that you said yes to Jesus Christ and you made him Lord of your life, you became a vessel designed for the presence of God to live inside you. Like the moment it happened, you are designed for that. You are a container. You're a vessel. You are made to, to hold God's presence. The second thing that you need for a filling to happen is a fountain, like something that's pouring, right? Something that is, that, is, that is sending out this substance, this stuff that we're gonna be filled with. And that is our Father, our God, that is an unending fountain and presence. But here's the third thing. That in order for us to be filled, what, what a filling requires is space in the container. Because you could be a container, and we know we got a great fountain, but if there's no space in the container, then you may get a splash. You may get a little bit. Most likely, it'll just run right off. There needs to be space in our cup. I don't know about you, but sometimes I'll go to a restaurant, and those restaurants that just really love their ice, you know what I'm talking about? And they fill the cup up with ice. And then you just wonder, like, is this because sweet tea is expensive? Like, what's the, like, why are we cutting back here? But then they'll give you that little splash of sweet tea, but it's all ice. And as you start to drink, you know, the ice hits you in the face. And then you try to get that one little splash at the bottom of the cup. And what happens? All the ice just bam. And then you look awkward in a restaurant and you have to get a napkin out. It's the whole thing, right? Like, we all have been there. We've all experienced that. Okay, this is the picture that I have of you and I, of our church, you individuals, families, as a church, is our cups are so full that the Holy Spirit wants to give you a whole lot more, but there's no room for a whole lot more, so we have to settle for a splash, just a little bit. And if we're going to be reliant on the Holy Spirit, then we have to say, Holy Spirit, what's the ice in my cup? What are the things that are filling my cup and keeping you from filling my cup? Is it, is it sin? Is it resentment? Is it bitterness? Is it shame? Is it guilt? Is it unforgiveness? Like, what is it that's filling up my cup? Because God's saying, I'm a great fountain. It's an unending fountain. There's so much of me that I want to pour out on you right now. There's so much of me that I want to give your family and this church. But your cup's full. Your cup's full. I don't know, maybe right now God's just... Holy Spirit's just pinging something in your mind and you're like, it's that, it's this. This needs to be cleaned up. Jesus, help me. Who do I need to forgive? What, what sin do I need to walk through? Repentance and restoration. What, what, what things in my life do I need to walk through so that I can get some ice out of my life and allow more of the filling of the Holy Spirit in me? Because when we are full of him, when we are filled with the Holy Spirit and we go through life, as a cup or a container, and we bump into life and we bump into circumstances, we bump into people, what's in the cup is what splashes out of the cup. And what Paul says in Galatians 5 is that when you are filled with the Holy Spirit, what splashes out of the cup is joy and love and peace and goodness and patience and self-control. That's what splashes out when you are filled with the Holy Spirit. It just naturally begins to flow out of us. 
So what's the ice? What's the thing that's filling your heart, that's filling your life right now, that's, that's keeping you from being filled with the Holy Spirit? Because if we're gonna be the church that we're called to be, if we're gonna continue moving toward the mission and the vision that God has for us, we have to be reliant on the Holy Spirit. And that means more and more and more of Him. That means right now, you know what, let's do this. Wherever you are, just close your eyes. Close your eyes, hold, hold your hands up, palms up, just for a moment. And listen, if you're new or this is uncomfortable, then just don't sweat it. Everybody else that, that you know, just if you can, do it. And I want you just to just ask the Holy Spirit, fill me. And Holy Spirit, if you can't fill me, show me what's in the cup. Reveal to me what's keeping you from filling me. But today I need a fresh filling. And then tomorrow I need a fresh filling. And then Tuesday and Wednesday and next week, I need a fresh filling. The way we become the church is not me, Trey, up here doing all of this. The way we become the church empowered by the Holy Spirit is when we all do what we're doing right now, every single day. Holy Spirit, fill me. Holy Spirit, throw out all the junk and the stuff and the hindrances, the blocks, and fill me with your presence, your spirit. God, I just thank you for what you're doing today. I see just a glimpse of it in the spirit, but I just know there's so much that you're doing right now, that you're revealing. And I pray today as we, we even close today with ministry time, Lord, I just encourage everybody that needs to to come down and pray and let us sync up and support and come together. But ultimately, God, whatever it takes to clean out our cups so that we can experience more of your filling, so that we can be the church you've called us to be, so that we can be the family you've called us to be. God, I thank you for what you're doing right now in this moment. You are moving, and I thank you. Just continue, God. Continue to move. Even as we leave this place, Holy Spirit, keep speaking to us. Keep guiding us and directing us. Tomorrow when we get in, in, that, in that place of silence and solitude, our quiet time, our time with God, I just pray a fresh filling. A fresh filling. Lord, we love you, and I just thank you for what you're beginning today. I thank you for the move of God that we feel, that we sense, that we're experiencing right now, the excitement, the joy, the passion, God, that is happening all around this place right now. God, I just thank you for that. God, may we, may we lean in, may we jump in, may we be committed to what you are doing in your church. May we fall in love with your bride. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you so much for watching and being a part of City Hope. And listen, uh, if you feel like you need to take a step, maybe it's a decision to follow Jesus or, or getting prayer for something that's going on in your life, or maybe it's even just getting connected to our church and growing in community with other believers. We wanna give you the opportunity to do that. So right now, there's a QR code coming up on our screen. Follow the link and give us the opportunity to connect with you. Because if we know anything, it's that content alone is never going to help you uh, find the life change that God has for you. So look, give us the opportunity to connect with you. We'd love to get to know you and help you grow and be a part of our church. But we love you. Can't wait to see you next time right here at City Hope.